Welcome back to Get Your Voice Out There. I'm Roberta Chaitis. This show is dedicated to people in the community who want to get their voice out about different projects that they're working on. And today is a very special program. I'd like to introduce you to Katiti Karande. Katiti, nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Very, very happy to have you. And Bill Winder. Thank you. Thank so you so much. And you are a couple who have dedicated your life to a particular project. And our audience is going to want to learn a little bit about you mm -hmm. and how you came about with this mission. Mm -hmm. So, Katiti, why don't I start with you and just tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Well, I was born in Uganda in East Africa, which is where we do our work. Um, into a family uh, that has a long tradition of working for its country. Uganda is in East Africa. And uh, my father was the first ambassador to the United Nations, and my great-grandfather was the first African to be knighted. And in their capacity, they really worked very hard to really uplift the lives of the people of Uganda as much as they could. And I came here. Um, I've gone to college here in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and stayed behind and worked. And now I really dedicate myself completely to the Kiranda Education and Health Fund, which we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. And we have one slide that I want to bring up, our first slide, which is a map of Uganda. So let's bring that up and we can talk a little bit about where it is in the world and then we'll work right into your mission and your project. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we actually work in Uganda, in East Africa, um, in a little town. It's actually a, a, a combination of, of villages. It is a, a sub-county. It's 60 miles from Kampala, which is the capital city. And we work there with um, the villagers to uplift their lives. Um, there are a, a population of 6,000 people, 4,000 of whom are children, many mm -hmm. of them orphans. Mm -hmm. And we've been in that, up there in that village now for, it's going on seven years we've been working with them. Although our real work with them began in 2004, we didn't really formalize a relationship till 2007. And I guess we never really mentioned the name of your organization. That would be good for our audience to know. It's the Karande Education and Health Fund. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Bill, would you like to share a little information about that, how that came about? We, <coughs> uh, I think it was in 2005, we visited uh, Uganda and we noticed that there was this uh, tremendous diversity in, in, uh, in the way children were. Most children, you know, they wear uniforms there. They, uh, they're, you know, they're reasonably well-dressed. They're fed. They, they play they, they, and, and study, those kind of things that children usually do. But then we saw also these children that, that were ill-clad, uh, just wandering around. They looked hungry. They were dirty. They were... Uh, uh, it just they, they were like walking zombies, and we couldn't understand that. And when we finally tracked down a friend uh, that we were, uh, Samuel Tusubita, uh, who was a native of that country, and we had met here actually in, in Boston years before, um, he explained that these children were orphans and that there was a tremendous problem in that country uh, with, with orphans. And, and it was that really, that sort of was the seed of, of the, in the beginning of our sort of thinking about that we wanted to get behind this. They had, they had actually, uh, Samuel had, uh, with several other people, had formed an organization that was trying to encourage families to take in mm -hmm. uh, orphans, and, and their job was to support them as much as possible. Because these are, we're talking about subsistence farmers, very poor people who live in a very remote region of, of uh, Uganda. And I believe we have a picture of that. Uh, picture number two, we might want to bring that up. Go right ahead. You can keep talking. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's a it's such a beautiful country. But our our uh, you know so in the beginning we started to um, you know we started raising money mm -hmm. um, to do some some of the work, and which we'll we'll cover later. But they. Uh, there was a tremendous need. They were. They had this. They understood their issues there, but uh, uh, they were really ill-funded, and uh, and I think, frankly, a little bit burned out trying to do the things that they wanted to do. Mm. Uh, and at the time we started out, there was like 18 families. We now have about 100 families that we're dealing with, and you're talking about at least um, I don't know five to six hundred children, and and probably about a third of those are orphans. So it's a huge. I know. When Deal. I think of, of orphans, Katiti, I, I think of people who don't have a family mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. So they're really out there on their own. So uh, speaking of family, we have another picture, number three, that brings us back to the family that you were talking about. And also, so we can, we can actually understand where you're coming from and why your approach is so different. Okay. So, um, for us, you know, remember that Uganda is a country that went through a long period of um, colonization. And when we got our independence in 1962, I think the country has struggled through many, many wars and, and disruptions and that sort of thing. So, um, these orphans are actually, um, you know, they are just due to wars and HIV disease, that sort of thing. And, and my own family, lucky for me, I came from, the, that slide up there shows my great grandfather who was the first African person to be knighted. Mm. So I had all the privileges that these poor children can't have. And that really was a big motivating factor for me. And uh, my family, of course, as I said, was always involved in making sure that the lives of Ugandan people are bettered in any way that they could be by the actions that my family could take. Mm -hmm. yeah, he, was, so, he was really progressive in, in wanting, you know, believing that education and health care was sort of fundamental to the success of any society. And that was a different philosophy? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, even in our own country here, because now I'm an American citizen, you know, teachers aren't exactly paid like pop stars or, or baseball players, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that everywhere, education is always hard fought for. Uh, but he, I think he was ahead of his time in Africa, saying African people should be educated. They should be, mm -hmm. they should have good health. And he tied the two together. Uh, and my father along, came along after him. And the thing to remember when you think about these orphans is that Uganda um, does not have a uh, safety net like you do here. The, we don't have a child services department or anything like this, you know. These kids were on the streets. The girls were engaging in prostitution, getting raped. The boys were fighting. They were stealing. They were mm -hmm. just, you know, it was a, and there was a whole lot of them because of the problems and difficulties that Uganda has gone through. And it was a real need. And Bill mentioned that our friend Samuel and his wife, they were trying to do something to help some of these children in this little remote village. So it was actually a real good, nice confluence of, uh, of circumstances that we came along and they were trying to do that and we noticed it and we could concentrate our efforts with people who were actually doing something because where do you begin? It is such a big problem mm. over there and, and I think we've been able to do quite a bit. You have and I watched your TED talk mm -hmm. and I was very moved by what you had to say about about the process to help the people in Uganda. Would you like to just speak a little bit about that and then yeah, talk about I think about we can it? both talk to that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we first connected up with Samuel and his organization, the Chigalama Children's Initiative Kitchen, mm -hmm. they were really underfunded. But we thought, my goodness, you know, what can we do? So we went home, we raised some money, we sent them some money. And it wasn't really till 2007 that, after my father died, that we decided to start this organization to honor him and my great-grandfather and um, formalize our relationship with them. And um, Samuel invited us to meet with them and to talk to them. And we thought, 
you know, wow, can you take in some of these orphans, you villagers? And they, yes. were, they said, well, we're barely making ends meet ourselves. We ourselves cannot support, barely support our own children. Our own children are not going to school. We can't really take in pe people, other people, because uh, we don't have the resources or the means. And uh, we said, well, what's the biggest problem? Well, we don't have potable water. Now, Bill can speak to that much better than I can. Um, you I, know. <clears throat> I think it's, it's, it's so hard for us here to understand what the issues are in a, in mm. a country like this. I mean, as I've said many times, I don't, you know, I don't know, understand the socioeconomic problems in Beverly or in, or in Newton, Massachusetts, right. let alone in Uganda. And I think that uh, it's in, so difficult to, uh, to really envision what's really going on there. And it's people, if, if, you, can, if you can just imagine that, that uh, go home, shut off your water, uh, take away your electricity, take away your job, take away any job within a reasonable distance, uh, from you. Um, uh, uh, you. You basically have no education. Your children have to go to a remote water hole where they're getting dirty, uh, dirty water that's contaminated. Uh, you know, it's just almost impossible. So we, re we began to realize that, that there really is, people need a sense of hope. And uh, so that was such a, uh, you know, fundamental thing that, that, that we had to deal with. Yes, and, and you see, you know, they, they really had no scope outside of their little village. You know, you get in your car and you, you tootle off to Cambridge or you go here and there as we came all the way up here. You know, basically they were, they were trapped, they were really trapped right. in subsistence farming because their resources are just so limited and their vision was limited. And, but the one thing they knew, and they made this very clear because we thought, oh, what is your problem? They were saying, well, you know, our children go down to the well and the girls are getting raped and animals are eating them and they're drowning. And we thought, oh, well, we'll give you a well. <laughs> and they, but they're sick of that. They're tired of solutions, which we come up with. So we thought, we said, well, all right then. And Samuel told us, he said, think of this more holistically. Mm -hmm. let's, let's really do something different here. He's a brilliant man, and he's one of these people who is, just loves his country and wants to do good for his people. So we really sat with them. We came at this thing very differently than most NGOs, and we sat with them, and they explained to us and what they needed. And we came home, and Bill and Samuel worked it out that what they truly wanted was to be able to have rainwater cisterns attached to their home so that the water was actually readily available. Mm -hmm. This way, because you know, the children, as they were going to the wells and spending hours and hours, were barely getting any work done. They were, they were getting sick from the water as it was. Mm -hmm. anyway, it was just a just a lose lose. And could they have these cisterns so that they could just turn the tap and have water available? And we said, struck a bargain. You take in some orphans, we'll give you a, a water tank and. You're going to have to have some skin in the game. You will build the pad, yeah. the drainage system, the whole thing. It's up to you to participate as well. And actually, that to them, it's an interesting thing. Showed respect that, you know, we do respect them as well. We think they mm -hmm. can also participate. And it's something I learned from watching my father when I was young. We would go out to the countryside where he owned a lot of land and uh, people bring him some skinny cow and give it to them, would think, you've got a thousand cows, but what do you need with their cows? But he showed them the respect by thanking them very graciously, mm -hmm. profusely, and involving them in you know, their community. Not that he comes over and just sort of lords it over them, but right. they had something they could give him as well. And this was really very positive, and it started a relationship with them that we feel, um, you know, has been really very positive. Yeah, and the, and the tanks, I don't think we even understood the, the value of the tanks, the fact that, you know, the, the, there's a double sort of meaning to the, mm -hmm. to the uh, or, or, you know, double benefit, because the, not only were the children healthier, they're not mm -hmm. getting ringworm, uh, they're not getting, you know, these uh, possible diseases from E. coli and that kind of stuff, 
but also, you know, took away child drudgery. Mm -hmm. These kids were making a trip in the morning, mm -hmm. before school, a trip after school, and then by the time they have dinner, it's dark, it's equatorial. It's absolutely yeah. exquisitely beautiful there. The climate is temperate, uh, but it also let it also let the kids have time to actually. They maybe have been going to school, but when do they have time to study and read? They don't have electricity, right. so and it's seven thirty. And play. lights are out. They're in, and play. And play. And play. And we have a picture that shows one of the projects that you're working mm -hmm. on. That's picture number. Well, we have picture number four that we can bring up as well. And picture number five, you can bring both of those up. You so know, this is the water that they were getting and that they were drinking. And you can see the girl's got horrid ringworm on her head. That and is you a can girl. see <laughs> you can see the, the, the quality of the water and the water hole. And a week before we I think we took that picture or one like that, a child had drowned, fallen in. One of these, the deeper holes. Uh, one of the deeper holes. So mm -hmm. yeah, and um, I think your next slide will show the the tanks. Right, that's number five, and um, uh, and then we'll save the last two pictures for a little more discussion. Yeah. Mm. But I, what I'm getting from this is, don't try to fix the problem. Find out what the problem is. Right. Yes, that's what I'm hearing. Yes, you know, I mean, I think that because uh, you had asked me beforehand when we talked on the phone or at, at some conversation we'd had about. You know, what made this um, different is that, in fact, we don't come to Uganda with a Western thought out solution. Okay? We don't helicopter in and to fix the problem. We don't say, we've got $5,000 now and uh, we're going to build this well or build this thing, and when our time runs out and our money, we leave. We engage with the community. Right, it's because when you leave, they're still in Uganda. Right. And nothing's changed. Exactly. They, don't, they never had any buy-in. They don't care about that thing. If it breaks, the kids come, take the parts, fight with each other, swords, you know, um, and uh, kid around. with. So um, it really... What, what type of help do you need uh, to make, make a bigger difference, I should say? Yeah. <clears throat> They decided to end the, uh, the water project because the families that are involved have, have all have water, water tanks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and they, are, they are a sustainable thing. They have, you know, they, these tanks are good for at least 35 years. There's a lot of, there's a lot of solutions out there that, that, that uh, collect water, but they're good for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the wells tend to, that they dig are just pounded wells. They clog up and create those mud puddles that you saw in, the, in, the, uh, in that last photograph. Uh, so, and then the you know, water flows downhill. And uh, not to be crude, but you know, animals go to the bathroom. And when it rains hard, that washes down into these mud puddles and they're collecting this water. Uh, but so that was, that was probably the water was, of course, is essential to life and was so important. But uh, we then moved on and, and uh, we had through a number of negotiations with them. Their biggest thing was that they live in very small houses. They produce corn, uh, bananas, uh, uh, coffee, coffee, mm -hmm. and uh, but corn. I've, I've learned so much from this. <laughs> I'm not a farmer, but uh, you know they can't dry. They can uh, sun dry corn, but they can't. Uh, uh, but they can't dry it enough. To store it, mm -hmm. and they have little tiny houses, so they don't have any place to really store it. So they have to sell it, and of course they have to sell it at the bottom of the market, and and they usually get cheated. So they want, they were adamant. It's a, I just I was just floored by the fact that they really they really under they had all this information, mm -hmm. and when you go there, it just it really just it, I, I hate to use the word mind blowing, but in fact it's 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 the way it is. I mean they they're, they were. I never, I'm an architect, and I've never had such an easy job of programming a building. They wanted, they wanted to um, have a place where they could store, process, and market their goods, their, their produce, as well mm -hmm. as things that they made. And uh, they, they knew that you know, it was mostly going to be run by the women, and that they, would, uh, that they wanted a place for the children to play. Uh, there was a, there's a, they have no access to real health care. So we decided to, to uh, add, include, part, in, in, uh, include in that uh, an area where a visiting physician could come mm -hmm. 
periodically and do health education and uh, and uh, and and do you know checkups and minor health care. And as I'm listening to you, I don't want us to forget about giving a little information to the audience as to how they can reach you. And I also want to uh, bring up the the picture of the bricks. Of course, of uh. course. So well, that's picture number six, I believe. So, so that actually, there's a lot of, that speaks to a lot about our success over there. As you said to Bill, what do you need? You know, wh I think what we need is to help building this business center. Mm -hmm. This is really our latest project. We're trying to f raise money for it, and that brick machine is actually. Um, having given them these, these cisterns that they're standing proudly in front of, mm -hmm. um, the next slide will obviously be the brick machine that we able to raise money for and buy for them so that they could actually start making the bricks for this business center that Bill designed for them. Because, But here's what's interesting. When we first got there and we saw how Africans make bricks, you can see those very crude bricks and in, in, they're not, it's not a it's very efficient in the picture. way. Mm. The pictures um, were just on, you can see the rather crude. Crude bricks and, and, and they're not even and, they, and they're burning down forests. And we spoke to them about, you know, you, sh you really should do something different in the way of making bricks, people. And they, were, they couldn't even begin to, to relate to this other way of doing bricks with this brick machine that Bill just described to you. Mm -hmm. But over the years, because we've been working with them, they've gained enough trust in us that they were like, okay, we'll try the brick machine. So this is a big thing, because these are rural people. And in many ways, sticking with them, a lot has happened. They now are able to discuss with us matters of, you know, rape and uh, domestic abuse, Yes. Things that we never even touched on before with them and were able to touch on because they believe that we're really there with them. We've respected them and listened to them to give them what they want and need. And so it's really been a very, very different kind of, I think, NGO outreach. And they're proud of their country. You know, it, very you much know. so. You don't very want to much be telling so. them. Yeah. No, 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 you're doing this wrong. It's just a better way. That's right. You know, for them. Let's, that's right. And yeah. I think that, you know, once you don't even know, you saw those people standing in front of the, um, of the machine, the, 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 the water tank, mm -hmm. the water cistern, mm -hmm. proudly. You know, giving them those water cisterns was like lifting an incubus off their backs. Mm. It freed them to think of possibility. What else can we do? They were able to discuss this business of, of, of the business center only because they now had hope. They believed that more could happen for them than just living and digging and toiling on their land. Mm. And speaking of that business system uh, center, I want to bring up our last picture of the center so people can see the beautiful work that's being done <clears throat> by you. Designed by Bill Windsor, Designed architect. Bill. <laughs> Do you want to say a word about that center? Yeah, it, it, uh, what really shows that, that what we're doing is working is that they grabbed onto this so hard and we, we bought this machine that makes a uh, environmentally friendly brick that doesn't have to be fired, it's more stable and uh, we introduced that uh, a year ago, uh, a little more than a year ago, and they have been making bricks with this thing uh, uh, for, the, for the future center. Uh, one of the, the land has actually been donated already for this, mm -hmm. and it needs to get registered and a few other things like that, but uh, we're, we're moving. And I think, the, I think if anything, I, I always feel like I have this sort of pressure on the back of my neck to keep, you know, to keep, keep up with these people. Mm. Um, and they're, they're very excited, and, and they, uh, they, I think they really, uh, I can't reinforce more the fact that they really feel like there is hope mm -hmm. and that these things are going to happen. So many people have come through their community and just done these little projects, and they have to try to help them and support them, and then yeah. they move on. These people are exhausted, and they get tired of it, and we had to overcome that in the beginning. And they must be so excited to see you visit. When, how often do you get to go... We try to go at least once a year or every other year. We really do. But, you know, if I could leave you with one thing, Roberta, it's that, yes. it's that what we really try to do, the Kiranda Education Health Fund, is 
And we hope to move from village to village, you know, like once this is done mm -hmm. and these people have their business center, they're doing business, they're making money, they're now selling their own corn. Some guys are coming around and saying, it's really two pounds when the guy really knows it's five pounds. Mm -hmm. They're getting their, their spoils of their, of their labor. Um, we are not going to be sending them money to send their children to school. They'll be paying their own children's school fees because we have hopefully changed the socioeconomic ecosystem so that it can support their efforts to, have, to run their own lives and sustain themselves and their children and raise them to become fully realized and contributing citizens. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, that this is, is our goal. That is the message that is so strong, and I, I felt it when we talked in person, mm -hmm. and hearing you here it, with Bill, uh, it is definitely making a difference in my mind as well. Yeah. I think our biggest issue... And our audience, of course. I think our, the biggest thing that we need to do is, uh, is, is focus on building a, a larger base. We have some wonderful supporters right now, and, mm -hmm. and it's really been miraculous in some ways. But uh, yeah, we need to broaden that base of support do, to get do. this thing this K thing done. Katiti, why don't you mention your website and? Yes, indeed, we have a wonderful website that was set up by our wonderful intern Katie O'Loughlin, who actually has moved us from, you know, into the twenty first century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's called info at Kirandi Education and Health Fund dot org. That's info at Kironde Education and Health Fund dot org. And I want to spell that. That's K I R O N D E. That's correct. For the beginning. Thank you. Yes, and, and the, <clears throat> but that's that's the that's the that's uh, the email address. That's the email, but the website is Kironde Fund dot org. Yes. Yes. But that that is if you want to get hold of us. That's and how it's you important get hold with us. the dot org because we all get confused with the dot right. com. Dot org dot, dot net I know, dot, I, dot, I know, dot whatever. I, so I want to give you an opportunity to say one more grand thing to our audience. You know, what can they do? What could they do for Uganda? What could they do for other places that they might have, a, have a, a, something in their heart for? You know, you can do anything, all right? This Kirande Education and Health Fund is made up of Bill Winder, Katiti Kirande, two board members who are regular friends and our wonderful intern, Katie. And never think that you can't make a difference. Anybody who wants to do it and wants to help can help. If mm -hmm. you want to help us, then please donate to us. We'd, we'd, we'll be very happy to have your donation mm -hmm. and um, help us in our work because I think it, we think it's good work. And by the way, um, because we're small, mm -hmm. we will be, when, by the time we leave there, it'll, it will have probably cost us $75 per child to, um, to change their, to life, change their forever. life forever. Yeah, and because when you donate to us, every single penny, that we don't have administrative costs because we do it out of our home. Hmm. So um, $75 Something like per that, 75 child to 100 maybe. To change their it lives. Seems like a very small amount. Amount. Mm -hmm. It, it really, makes a really difference is. in someone's life. And, and it's 100% of the money we get goes to up the project. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, at the end of a very meaningful discussion here, I, I just want to thank you both for your commitment and for the work that you're doing because it is beautiful. It's beautiful to be with you. It's beautiful to feel your energy and to understand how you worked with your, your country and you're, you're there for them. And I think that that, and you're there for them, and we're all there for them, well, but right. it's hard when they're so far away. And yes. some of us don't see that. Our mm -hmm. audience just got a nice picture of some way of life that maybe they just never, never knew. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you so much for coming all the way here. And hopefully we'll have another story another time, and maybe we'll have some guests that you can bring along from Uganda. Mm. Who knows? That'd be that nice. would be wonderful. Be great. Well, Roberta, thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank, thank you very you. much thank for you. having us and for you know, giving us this opportunity to get our story out. It was great. It was great.
And I'm Roberta Chaitis. This is Get Your Voice Out There. We'll be back with another show soon. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta.